So, uh, welcome, Sophie and Lisa. Thank you so much for coming. Perhaps we could give them a round of applause for showing up this evening. Thank you for having us. It's, it's a great thrill to have you here. We're enormously proud of all of our alumni, uh, and we love to watch the great things that you do. Uh, so I'm going to ask you about various things through our conversation, uh, but I want to start with your time at Parsons. Uh, perhaps you could just say a little bit about uh, the good bits, the bad bits. Did you enjoy it? What did you learn? What do you wish you'd learned? Uh, uh, and maybe some tips on what people should really be concentrating on achieving while they're here. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind when, when you say that is just that we had such a great experience with the other, the students and the faculty, and it was really almost felt like a collaborative effort in a lot of ways. Like all the students' ideas would be feeding off of each other. And it's really important to use that while you're here because I don't think I really realized that when you're out in the real world, really you only have yourself. And it's great to use this as kind of like, almost like a laboratory to really experiment and get everything out and all of your creative ideas out on the table, even if it's something that's maybe not, not so sellable or not so real world, but just to have that time to experiment and bounce ideas off of everyone else. And, figure out you know, with your instructors what's the best way to do something technically and really experiment. I felt like that was so valuable for me in that respect. What about you, Sophie? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, just one thing, you can't agree on everything with each other. Okay. Or we'll just <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it, when you leave Parsons, you're put into the real world and you have to you know, get a job. Um, and in your job, you're not really going to ever get to be as creative as you are at your time in, in art school, in design school. And I, I didn't really realize that until I left. And I look back on my days as part, at Parsons as really the most creative I've ever been. Because you're at school all day, night, for four years, studying, learning, and really getting to explore your own you know, style creativity, really find out kind of what it is that defines your design aesthetic. And um, that, to me, was the most valuable thing about Parsons. I still reference my croquis, my sketches, like drawings that I did from Parsons. Um, sorry, I think this feedback. That works OK. Um, and it's just a really great time to get all of that out. So. You know, just appreciate it and enjoy it while you have it, because once you're out of there, you got to think about profit margins and other things that are total buzzkills. Is there anything that you wish you'd spent a little bit more time on while you were at school that would have served you in in your careers uh, out on your own? I mean, we you know we we do lots of different things here. We do business and we do um, the craft, you know, the draping and the cutting, etc. But my sense is probably that you don't get a lot of time for sewing these days. You know, so. Would you wish you'd done a bit more business, maybe a little bit more networking, maybe spent more time interning? I feel like it's inevitably the one class that you decide you're not going to pay attention in. That's like, those are the skills that you really need once you get out of school. As I remember, um, we took a business class here that I kind of like, maybe didn't pay as much attention in that class as I should have, because I we didn't really intend to start a business. That was never my idea, at least. Um, to start my own line when I was in school. So I just kind of like did the reading or sometimes didn't do it and like got it done, whatever. I know um, while I was here, like a lot of our peers were really felt that way about a lot of the computer design classes. And a lot of my friends now are doing tons of design and flats and prints and stuff on the computer. And that's what they're doing. And that's what they were maybe not paying attention in. So I feel like it's. You really don't know what's going to happen when you graduate. You might think that you want to go out and work for a big company, um, which was the case with me. I really wanted to go out and work for like a, a designer or even like a big company like The Gap, and didn't work out that way. So I decided to start my own line with Sophie instead. But um, I think it's really important to pay attention to everything. Something that we talk about at the school quite a lot is um, branding yourself, which is an awfully crass way of putting it. 
but I think there's something in there. I mean, we talk to some designers who have left the school and gone on to create their own labels, and they identified their vision very early on. And I know that I've spoken to some people that are familiar with your work when you were at school, and there, was, there were elements of what you were doing then in the work that you're doing now. It was a very logical and natural progression. How important do you think that is? I think that, I mean, I think that's really one of the most important things um, when you're at Parsons to develop. Really, how do you see yourself as different? What is your, how is your product going to be different from what's in the market? And really, when you're in school reading women's wear, reading the magazines, following up on style.com, walking around the city like you're in New York City, which is such an advantage to any other design school. Like this is really the center of like street fashion. Um, and you can just walk around and get inspired and figure out kind of what your take is. Like you guys are all young. What is the youth culture right now? What is your understanding of it? Like how can you design things that there's a need for that you see yourselves and your friends wearing? And how do you articulate that into a brand, into a collection? Um, how do you see that fitting into the market? Knowing those sorts of things are really what's going to enable you to impress somebody at a job or to start your own collection. Um, you know, trying to think of the big picture of fashion. Yeah, I think um, I mean, we just had a friend in today from uh, a school in England outside of London, and they were saying, you know, they'd heard that Donna was here last week and they heard that you were here this evening and how fortunate we are being in the middle of the fashion center in the middle of New York City and we're able to have this exposure and how absolutely vital that is. And I, I think one step further is the internship opportunities. We were just talking upstairs about the fact that you have a couple of interns from Parsons, so I think, I hope we're here somewhere. But um, can you talk a little bit about how important you think that is, you know, the opportunity to take part in the real industry before you leave school? Definitely, that's actually going back to your, your previous question that I answered. I, I think that's the thing that I really would have spent more time doing, be interning and, and um, even like working at a store and just getting a more a more varied experience from several different perspectives like even getting an internship at places where you don't even necessarily want to work just to know that okay I really don't like being at a small company or I don't like being at a big company or I know I, I don't want to do this even narrowing it down from that perspective or realizing or discovering something that you love like maybe you really have a talent for like you know sales or selling selling clothes and talking with customers and understanding people and maybe you find a way to apply that in the kind of job that you want after graduation but that's paramount i think i think uh, that's a very good point because as much as it's important to identify your inner vision you don't really know what that is until you until you know and yours was clearly to work together and create this brand with a very strong point of view. But someone else's might be some other part of the industry. You know, as much as we might come in thinking we're going to do one thing, it's very, um, it's very natural that we might end up doing something completely different. Which wasn't really a question, was it? <laughs> so <clears throat> here's something that I think um, people should, should perhaps benefit from hearing more about. You're both still very young. How you set your businesses up, your business up when you first left, how, was an issue, how much of an issue was the fact that you were incredibly young then? And how did you overcome that? Um, I, starting out, we kind of decided to split up our responsibilities. So I took on more of the, like, the production aspect, which um, we had zero, zero contacts um, in terms of production. So I remember Sophie and I, um, we, got a, we had a trunk show after we had our first collection at Sophie's house. And we got a few orders from like friends and family, and we used their money to pay for the production and then also fund um, like the samples for the next collection. And I remember um, having no factory contacts. We literally took a bag of clothes around to buildings like in this neighborhood on 8th Avenue that looked like maybe they'd be big enough to have a factory in them, and then looked in the masthead to see you know, names of businesses that maybe sounded like factories and then just walked up there and pretended to be doing costing for my boss. That was kind of how I got around that. I used to pretend that I had a boss all the time because I was so scared that no one would take me seriously because we were 21 yeah, when we, we started this. We, we were 20. We had no idea what we were doing. And I think that, you know, 
Parsons teaches you so much, but no education is really going to teach you how to have a startup business and how to run it. I mean, you just kind of have to go into it and learn everything as you go and make a ton of mistakes. And I think when you're 21, you have enough energy for that. Um, so I think in a way, it was great that we were so naive and that we started this business so young because we were able to work seven days out of the week to make mistakes and try again and again and again until we got it right. Um, and, you know, it was okay that people didn't take us seriously. We thought it was funny, you know. It, it was fun. It was all just a big adventure, so. Yeah, um, and we had nothing to lose. Yeah, if, we had if nothing we failed, to lose. We'd go get a job Whatever. at Gap, you know, or on 7th Avenue like everyone else did. But, you know, it was, it was nice to... Uh, it was a fun thing to just go out there and, and start something. And that's the thing that, you know, is great about living in New York is that you have the access to make a collection and show it during Fashion Week and invite any editor to your show. Um, there's no rules that say you can't. Anybody can be listed on the fashion calendar to have a show. If you are making something and you want to put it out there, you can invite people. And maybe not everybody will come, but a few people will come. And it's much easier than it seems. If you put the work into it, there's an audience for it. And um, it's one of the great things about being in New York. Yeah, I think that was like the most shocking discovery when we first started this, was that we you know, decided that we, we were going to have a show um, during Fashion Week. And it was amazing to us that you actually just can go out and send invites to all the people at the magazines. and they might actually come some of them and we were able to like scrape enough money together to make a collection and sew a lot of the samples ourselves and start showing them to stores and like I was saying before like find a factory it's all totally doable and I think once we realized that it got us really like up and running realizing that it's it's totally possible I think um, <clears throat> one of the big learnings for a lot of people is the reliance on relationships. Um, you know, you have to develop, relate. it's all very well to leave school without any, which is fine, but you've got to build on them. Have you found that there have been people through the years that you've been working that have come back to you with help or advice or you've gone back to? Yeah, ab absolutely. I think uh, one of the best things um, about, you know, saying you've gone to Parsons when you graduate is that people really recognize the name and you can basically call anybody to meet with. And we met with, you know, we met with like heads of companies, editors, we would just cold call people and say, listen, I'm starting a business. I just graduated from Parsons. You know, can I come in and have 10 minutes of your time? And it's so helpful to get that advice. And people love giving advice. like. You know, especially people that have been successful, they love helping other people and they love like talking about their experience and their journey. And it's you always learn something from meeting with those people. And I think a lot of relationships that we formed that we have now in terms of mentors for our business are, are people that we met with early on that have watched our business grow that still check in with us. And the other thing about relationships is so many of the kids that you are meeting in school that are your peers you're going to end up going through, you know, your full fashion career alongside them doing different things and you can help each other. So it's really important to to stay in touch with um, other students and friends you make in school. So um, <clears throat> one of the big things that uh, we do here uh, is, are competitions. You know, there are a lot of competitions and of course it's a very, very competitive industry. Uh, you uh, recently uh, were finalists in the CFDA Vogue um, uh, competition. How did that have? What kind of effect did that have on your business? Did you know? Did you meet people? Did it? Did, was there any other kind of assistance that you got from that? Um, yeah, I mean that the CFDA Vogue um, Fashion Fund was probably like the biggest thing happened to our our company. Um, it we we did it twice. The first time we were nominated, and the second time we were runners up, and. Um, it really allowed us to meet a lot of people we didn't have access to in the industry that were um, that were able to connect us with like the Gap collaboration um, or with different business mentors. Um, so that was 
that was pretty big. It was pretty major. I mean, for, I'm sure many of you are aware of it, but it's um, it's a, a not really a competition, but it's a, a fund where they look for small young businesses to invest in, essentially. And so the winning uh, company and then the two runners up get a cash sum and they get mentoring. But what's significant about it is they spend a lot of time working with the designers and interviewing them and talking to them and really figuring out if they're the kind of people that should be invested in. And I think that speaks to the relationship thing. But also, I think something that's very important here is the kind of people that you are. You know, we've all seen on television the prima donnas and there are certain TV shows that would suggest that that's quite a good thing to be. You know, they equate it with having a strong vision and being very passionate about what you do, which may be true, but that doesn't make it easier. You know, I think you can have, you have as you demonstrate, you can have a strong vision, but you can also be very easy to get along with and you can create good relationships and that helps you along the way. Yeah, especially if you're, if you're just starting out your business. Um, I remember, I mean, we both got a lot of feedback from people that we were working with, like certain fabric vendors or factories or sample sewers that would be like kind of surprised that we weren't yelling at them and that the fact that we were so nice to them made made them really like us and would you know we'd be able to be like you know we really really need this and they'd put our work in front of someone else's just because we were being kind to them and that really paid off and i'd i mean i'd say that so he brought this up before but i'd say the same thing about um really you know, having, maintaining relationships with your peers and being kind to them too because really you never know who you're going to end up with in the industry, who you're going to get a job alongside, maybe in the same company, but if you're peers from school and that's really, really important. I don't think being a diva does anyone any favors yeah, ever. Yeah, I, I don't know who started that bitchy fashion thing, like when that was invented in fashion history, but... I think it's I, I think it's out of style. Like I, I don't think it works. I don't think it gets you further. And I think that the new generation of designers, at least that are our peers that we've met through the CFDA and so on, are all really friendly and really supportive of each other. And I'd like to think that that time in fashion where people were really catty is is coming to an end. Because um, it's true, you just you don't get anywhere being being uh, being mean to people and. I think you highlighted a very important point, which is there's a huge amount of help out there. People really want to go out of their way to help young designers, whether they want to work for a, a big brand or whether they want to start their own business. But they only want to help the ones they like, the people that actually respond well to the help they're being given, because it's a very generous industry. There's, there's a lot that people want to do for the right people. And it's, you know, we've, I think we all have to be very, very conscious of that. So uh, on the subject of collaborations, you mentioned working with a Gap, and I think you've also worked with Converse. Um, so how do you decide which brands to partner with? Because of course there's a, there's a lot of collaboration going on. It's been quite the thing for a little while now. Um, are there people that you look forward to the idea of maybe one day partnering with? And you know, conversely, forgive the pun, are there um, other companies that you really don't think it would be appropriate to partner with? Um, yeah, definitely. I'd say, I mean, we're a really small company, so just to be totally honest with you, I mean, the it's kind of like a halfway point between, you know, how much are they going to pay us and if the brand is the right fit for our brand. And if, it's, if you're getting paid well and it's an amazing fit for your brand and your brand and their brand share a similar customer, then that's awesome. But sometimes you have to kind of make it work if in the interest of like, if you really need capital for something else you want to do in your business, sometimes you have to kind of just find a way to make it work. So, I don't know, it's both. Yeah, and that just goes back to, you know, having fun with branding. Like, if you're creative, you can take something that seems really boring and uh, make it really interesting. Like, when we were in, in uh, college, um, Tara Supkoff did a collaboration with Easy Spirit which was just brilliant. I mean, Easy Spirit was like for grandmothers and um, she took it and made it this really cool, like comfortable orthopedic shoes for hipsters and it was affordable and anyone could wear it. And, you know, trying to think outside the box like that with your branding, um, if you start doing that in school, you'll just continue to do it and it can open up doors and get you money to keep doing what you love to do. Yeah, I think it speaks to um, knowing what your brand or your vision stands for, but then knowing that 
there are other brands that can complement that. I mean, many designers have a very, very singular vision and they feel like it's got to be pure or it's just not going to work. And that's not the case. You know, we all have to be part of a team one way or another. If that means collaborating with someone, then so be it. I'm interested in what you think about the, the rash of collaborations with people like H&M and Topshop. Because this whole fast fashion thing is, you know, it gets a huge amount of press and some of it's very mixed. And then, of course, there's the slow fashion movement and there's the, you know, the movement towards craftsmanship and artisanship. Um, what do you think about that? I can't really see the collaborations being very exciting for very much longer. Um, they're, they need to evolve in some way. I don't think it's really anyone wants to read about you know, whoever, fill in the blank designer that's doing a collection for H&M, it's like not really that exciting anymore. So, I mean, I think in some way, I don't really know what it's gonna be, but there's gonna be need to be some kind of other layer that's added to that that makes it a little bit more interesting. I'm not really sure what that is. It's a tough one, because there's the argument that it is giving some version of designer clothes to the masses to people that simply can't afford to buy that designer in any other way. But equally, it is still landfill fashion, you know, by any other name. So, um, we train designers to do many things here at Parsons, but I didn't realize that one of the things we trained them to do was design Snuggies. Uh, there's a garment in your most recent collection that you both refer to as a Snuggie. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, um, you know, you can find inspiration anywhere, even on an infomercial. Um, we're very lowbrow with where we do our research. Sometimes it's at 2 o'clock in the morning on TV. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was just a joke that we said in an interview. Because sometimes interviews, you know, you need to spice it up. I was going to go on to ask if you think it's a sign of comfort dressing, but I think we'll leave that there. Um, sustainability is something that's very important to us here. Uh, and that means many things. That means organic and you know recycled, etc. But it also means sustaining certain skills, certain craftsmen skills, and it can mean working on very very luxurious products if it means nurturing the skills that go into creating that. Um, we had Donna Karen in uh, last week, um, and she is very passionate about it. But she's passionate about it personally. Her company isn't particularly. You know, she has the the Urban Zen, which is, but the Donna Karen collection. It's still just a collection. So I think that was a good example of someone that has a personal feeling, but business means they can't really do what they personally would like to. And I'm interested in hearing what you guys, you know, your take on sustainability and how that affects Vina Carver, but then perhaps how you personally feel about it as well. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we recently um, have incorporated into our collection. We started, we just started a new collection um, that is a... Uh, a lower price point, um, and it's just all t-shirts that are all made in America using eco-friendly fabric. And um, that was something that we couldn't apply to our main collection because um, we use a lot of high-end fabrics, and a lot of the eco-friendly fabrics they've developed just, it hasn't been around long enough that there's enough variation to find kind of what we need to do to execute our designs for, for the main collection. But for the t-shirt collection, um, there was a great variety of different jerseys that we could use. So that was one way that we kind of wanted to take responsibility. Um, but I do think, and what you're talking about with, with landfill fashion and the H&Ms and the kind of disposable clothing that people are obsessed with right now, making things that are to be carried on as like hand-me-downs, which is essentially like our biggest goal with our clothing, is that we want to make pieces that don't go out of style, that can be passed down from like a mother to a daughter, from a friend to a friend, that you don't want to throw away. And to me, that's like sustainable. I mean, you're making something that somebody is going to keep and wear over and over again. Um, and if you make something like that, I think it's, you know, it just supports the fact that you're not consuming, but you're but you're spending your money on something that's precious to you and you're holding on to it for a while. Yeah, I think that speaks to um, another topic that, that, that I've heard a lot about in the fashion industry, which is the, the possible evolution from the two-stroke four seasons a year showing, and really whether we should be designing things that 
in theory go out of style because you replace them in six months or in three months' time. You know, should we be? Should we, we we currently have two fashion weeks a year. Should we have one, or should we have one every you know two years, or should we have five, or should we just show in one place? I mean, there are so many different ways of approaching it. Uh, I, I know with Urban Zen, Donna Karen again likes to claim that she designs things that are not for one season, but they go on. You know, I think the hand-me-down thing uh, is a great way of looking at it. It is, of course, wonderfully sustainable. But what do you think about the, the future of Fashion Week? And not, not to say it's going to disappear, because I'm sure it won't, but should we be running exactly the same way that we are? Is there another way of doing this? Um, I mean, I, the timing of it, and I, I don't know if Donna Karen spoke about this, because I know she's like a really, she's... She's angry about the timing yes. of it. <laughs> um, the timing of it is weird, um, I think, just because, you know, everyone, at least prob probably most of you in this room, like go on style.com or many other websites at this point and look at collections like the day after they happen and so do people at H&M and all of these other fast fashion chains and it a lot of the time the clothes, the knockoff versions are out in the stores way before the actual designer version is and it, it doesn't really, it doesn't really make sense um, for the collections to come out, whatever it is, like f four or five months before the the uh, clothes hit the actual stores. And I think in the future it would make a lot more sense if the fashion shows were essentially for consumers, so that you could buy it immediately after you saw it on a runway, and it would be the collections would show right as the designers were shipping their goods to stores. That seems like it would make a lot more sense. Um, as far as having one fashion week a year, one fashion week every two years, I never heard that before. Did no, you just make that up right yeah, now? Yeah, I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> the, I think the point I'm getting at is, is, do we need to get everyone together? Does everyone need to fly around the world and be in the same city three months before you really need to see anything? Just so that they can go in magazines, so that H and M can knock it off. Poor H and M. I hope they're not here. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people are showing online now. It seems to make a lot of sense you know you can skype any number of people now into a room so you don't need to go there so it feels like there's a lot of different ways of doing this and yet there's a certain magic to being in a runway show you know there's a certain energy that it creates that i mean you guys uh, had a band on your runway this time uh there, have you got thoughts about how you're going to progress i mean you've done static shows and runway shows and now a runway show with a band what's next yeah i mean that's what you guys will show us um i think that's that's the cool thing about, um, you know, the internet right now and the way that people are sharing information is that there are a million ways to have an audience. And um, I, think that, I think that people are open to when you do something different and people are open to new ideas, especially with showing. People get bored of going to the same thing over and over again. And we were, you know, one of the first designers along with a few other designers um, to do presentations um, and to really explore kind of messing with the traditional fashion show format and showing off-site not showing in the tents and I think that will just continue I think that you know there is a system for fashion week and for for the catwalk and there's a, there's a reason why all of that stuff has existed it, it, it does work um, it's a very powerful when you go to a good show. Um, so I think that will always exist, but um, things will change. So do you not, I mean, it, it feels like the concept of a fashion show has evolved, though, because it used to be, 10 years ago maybe, it was buyers. It was buyers and press, and now it's friends and celebrities. You know, the front row used to just be the hardcore fashion people, and you go to some shows now and it's hardcore celebrities. So it feels like it's just to get in the press and that's all. And any serious buying gets done some other time. Yeah. I mean, is, I wonder what the, the culmination of that is. is. Is the fashion show just becoming a spectacle rather than a working event? It, yeah, I mean, I didn't know this when I was at Parsons, but um, basically all the buying goes on at the showroom. And so when you're a designer, you have all your clothes and they go into your showroom and you have a salesperson who sells everything and sits at a table with all the different stores that come in and they look at each piece and look at the wholesale and they place orders. And the fashion show really is just about press and it's about getting on style.com or in Women's Wear Daily 
and showing your collection to stylists and editors who will place it in their magazines. Um, and it's a branding tool. So um, that's a really good point you raise. I mean, people are starting to do movies instead of fashion shows. Some people just do like email, you know, email lookbooks. Um, there's a million different ways and it probably will just progress further to be more of like a, a tool for articulating like your world that season. Yeah, I think that's what it's really valuable for, at least for us, for a company of our size that we, we can't afford to um, advertise and we won't be able to for a really long time. So for us being able to get that look down of, you know, this season it was like, the girls had like long, really dirty ponytails with like Kool-Aid streaks in their hair, and it was this whole like upstate Woodstock, like eccentric camper kind of vibe. And that there's no way that would come across on a rack with all the clothes on it. But on the model with them there, we could really articulate it that way and style it in that way where that really came across. And that's where I feel like it's really valuable. I think uh, it speaks to the whole the thing you mentioned earlier about uh, collaboration and you know working with other people relationships you know the fact that you can do these things and the fact that if you at some point you want to make a film you've probably run into people that can help you with that you know the fact that you showed at Milk for the last couple of seasons is because you know the people there and they wanted to have you there so it, a lot of it comes back to relationships as well so um, you've mentioned the t-shirt line that you're doing uh, which is a new thing this season what else are you looking at? What's next? I mean, where are you planning to go with, with the Vina Carver brand? We were talking about that on the subway on the way over. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, it's our dream to open a store. I feel like what we have that Sophie was talking about that is really our strength is our brand and our idea of our world. Um, and that's, it's so easy for us to see how that would be translated into into you know music and books and all of these other I mean other categories that we could make but just also other things that we just like and think are cool and having some kind of interior space that we could really make our own I think would be so awesome so we're trying to find a way to make that happen yeah, I have a sense of that having been to your studio which is very cool mm -hmm. you got you start to see the the Sophie and Lisa world so um uh, one of our other alums just directed a film that seems to be doing fairly well, um, Tom Ford. The, mm -hmm. um, any plans to do other things outside of the Vina Carver world? I mean, do you... Absolutely. I think, you know, the fun thing about owning your own business, and particularly in this area of fashion where people are starting to do new things and push the envelope, um, is that you get to collaborate with friends and you can... Um, try and do lots of different projects. So um, we have a running joke that's funny that we <laughs> are going to become DJs and start to DJ all of the work events we have to go to. <laughs> so um, that's something we want to do. And um, we also want to keep having live music uh, at our shows. We have ideas for different photo projects we want to do where we photograph like real people, our friends, our moms, um, lawyers that wear our clothes in their settings and make a book of it and just send it out as like a tool to our stores and to our customers and put it on our blog. Um, we have a blog that we're pretty into, which we post just different things we're interested in that day. Um, so, you know, the clothes are really where we make our money, but I think that people want to see kind of everything that your company is about. It's more interesting that way. Yeah, and that and that's the other thing that makes we're so lucky that we get to do that because we have our own company. But in terms of relationships, like when we have a show, we have a friend that's in a really amazing artist whose work is is fits with our brand perfectly, and so we just hire her to make the installation for the show and you know we hire or we hire our friends that are, that are DJs who we think are really talented to do the music for before and after the show or you know the band that's like friends of ours um, so it's it's just like a big network and you know they're helping us we're helping them it's everyone's kind of like feeding off of each other 
So that, that leads me to, um, I think, the last question before we start asking for questions from the audience. But um, much of what you're talking about, I think, is because we're in New York and you can do that. And of course your friends are musicians and artists because, you know, everybody is pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, how important is being in New York to you? Because you're both from L.A. Did you ever think that Vina Carva could be somewhere else? Yeah, I mean, we both still go back to L.A. a lot, and we love traveling. Um, I think New York is a really great place to be when you're young and when you're out of school, when you're in school, um, because it's everybody here is, is very creative, and there's lots of museums, and it's, you know, it's all the cliches that people say about New York, but when people around you are all making things, it drives you to make things, and it... Um, it just makes for a really productive environment. So I think that it would be interesting to see if we would have done the same thing if we had been somewhere else. I think New York has had a big impact. I mean, you're right. There's, there are so many opportunities here. You know, we see them all the time. We see people that come to the school that want to help us because they happen to be in New York. You know, so many of the people, Fashion Week is here. As you said, I thought, thought that line earlier on was very good about it's all there. You can do it. You can get on the fashion calendar. You can tell everyone you're having a show and then just have a show. All you've got to do is make enough friends to actually model the clothes and get them made. It's all right here. And I think that uh, one of the challenges at school is it's very, very hard work. You know, getting th Actually, I want to ask you that as well. It's very, very hard work getting through Parsons. You don't have a lot of time to do anything else. But it's a tragedy if you don't take advantage of New York. So, yeah. sorry, I was just going to say, so what's harder, running your own business or graduating? I don't know. I remember having lots of breakdowns when I was a student at Parsons. I mean, now I have breakdowns. It's just a different hard. It's all hard. <laughs> but it's fun too. So what questions do we have from the audience? In previous worlds, I know that the questions have really been, how can we do what you're doing? Yeah. So I mean, I, I, I love the idea of emphasizing what are those things that you've got to concentrate on in order to succeed in the way that you guys are succeeding. Well, I think you know, at Parsons and particularly in this department, they're, you're really being trained to think creatively um, about clothing. But once you start a business, you realize that you have to think creatively about everything. Like we we made this collection, we had a show and we were so amped. I remember the right after Fashion Week, we just graduated from Parsons like three months earlier and made this collection and showed it. And then we were like, oh, well, what do we do? what do we do now? And we had to find a way to make some money so that we could, you know, pay for the samples for the next collection. And that, that ended up being, we had a, um, we, like you mentioned before, we're, we're both from LA. So we went back to LA with all of our samples. We put them on a rack in Sophie's backyard and we invited basically everyone we knew. Um, we made prices for everything and we just took orders. They paid us up front, and we used their money um, to pay for their production and then also the samples for the next season. And that was just something we kind of invented so that we could get by um, to the next season. And business is really all about that. You have to be creative in lots of different kinds of ways, not just your product, but the way that you market it and so many other things. I have a question about how you guys work together because I have a roommate and we kind of are thinking of doing something, but we, like, I don't even know where to, like, begin working with her, you know? Because we have, like, similar things that we like, but it's, you know, like, we're both, like, strong designers, you know what I mean? And I don't know. I just, that was my question. How do you divide up your responsibilities and, and how do you resolve differences? That's a great question. Um, it's been amazing having a partner both on the design level and on the business startup level. Um, in terms of having a business and starting a business with somebody, um, when we started it was just the two of us. So there was so much work that it was literally like in order to survive, one person could not handle it. We needed two people working all the time, um, doing different things. and and splitting up based on kind of what we were each naturally um, strong at. And, and the same thing with design. With design, 
it's a little bit different because you know you could always just go off and design a collection on your own but when you have two people you have double the the strengths and double the vision and so um, and it's always a constant conversation so you're always kind of putting something out there um, looking at it, changing it, bouncing back and forth so that the end product is this thing that neither one of you could have thought of on your own. And I think it's more challenging and I think the end product is is more interesting because it's like this weird baby. <laughs> um, Maybe with two moms. <laughs> yeah. But but if you want to start designing with your with your roommate, I would say, you know, really understand kind of what it is that you value about that person that you're collaborating with and and what they value about you and how you kind of see your ideas being strong together and letting each other do what it is that you're good at and um, being very supportive of each other and really opening up to each other's ideas and if you can have a very like open creative relationship with somebody it's really interesting and um, and very very challenging and rewarding. I think, um, Lisa, you mentioned when you two first started out, you took over the production side of it. Uh, it's, it's important for people to understand that design, if you're a designer, how much time do you actually spend designing out of your, you know, the season? Um, it's really, really minimal. It's, um, it's not what I thought it would be at all. I thought I would just be designing all day long and then take a break and like email and design some more. And really, it's, it's not like that at all. I'd say... We try and take um, like a, a chunk of time, maybe like three days or a week, um, a couple times a year, and design everything. This past collection, actually, that we just showed for Fashion Week, we designed in like a marathon weekend um, upstate in Woodstock. We just kind of like locked ourselves in a house and did the whole thing because there was no. We worked during the day just on like running our business and, you know, making sure the making sure all the orders are being placed and the, everything with the factory. It's just, it's a lot. So, so I'd I, say a couple weeks a year, yeah. maybe? So that's the key, I think. You know, as much as a duo might think they're going to design together, in fact, that's going to be a wet weekend in Woodstock and the rest of the season is going to be running the business. And you don't know what that is until you've run the business for a while. So, you know, I think dividing up the production and then the PR and then the sourcing and then the sales and then the negotiation and every other element of it is something that they've got, people have got to maybe experience working for someone else, even if it's just interning, and write down all the things that have to be done. Because maybe then that'll help you divide up. Another question? Hi, Sophie. She was my student. Okay, hi, Sophie, hi, Lisa. Um, there's a lot to a name. Okay, what does Vina Kava mean, and how did you come up with that? Um, we wanted to choose a name that wasn't one of our names, um, just because we didn't want to fail. <laughs> yeah, we didn't want to fail. And we also, you know, we were thinking that, you know, if we ever sold our company, we wouldn't want to sell our name, which is a big thing with designers that put their name on their company. Um, and we wanted to choose something that nobody really knew what it meant, but it had a certain feeling to it. So we um, we spent a whole day looking through different dictionaries, and um, we found a medical dictionary, and Vanakava was in it. And we both just immediately loved the sound of it. We loved the way it looked on a page. Um, we loved like the symmetry of the letters. Um, and it is the main vein that pumps blood to the heart. It's Latin which we didn't know. Um, and it just had a nice meaning and a nice sound to it. And um, I still like it. So you still like it? I still like it. Yeah, so it worked. Hi, I just had a question. Um, you mentioned that you wish Fashion Week could be for the consumer. Um, but one reason why it happens months and before is so that magazines can get it and feature it in their editorials. So I was just wondering how press from editorial magazines and your relationship with magazines has kind of helped with the success or just how important it is to kind of build a relationship with magazines and um, well I think relationships with magazines have been for us it's been less about like getting our actual product in magazines because we 
that that doesn't happen as often. Um, I feel like more important for us has been little like snippets about what we're doing or our collaborations or things that we're doing like kind of on a branding level. That's been kind of kind of key for us. Um, but yeah, I guess I guess that's I, it. I would add that um, the fact that you can articulate what you're doing. You know, you have your blog, and it's it's fascinating because it's very varied, and it but it says a lot about who you two are as people and what Vina Carver is as a brand. But again, something we mentioned when we were chatting earlier, um, being able to talk about what you're doing, you articulate your vision. We um we put the seniors in the BFA program through an extremely vigorous thesis review, and part of that is to force them to be able to talk about what they're doing. Is that something that you found has been very useful to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes we talk too much about what we're doing. I mean, whenever you're interviewed by the press, they're looking for that soundbite, and you've got to face up to it. That's what they're after. But if you can come up with it, then they'll feature you. And if you can't, maybe they'll feature the guy that can. So as much as it kind of feels a bit forced sometimes, it, it, I'm sure you find it incredibly important. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, you're selling, you're selling clothes, but you're one of, when I, when clothing is really good, and especially today because the market is so overly saturated, you want to buy, there's tons of black jackets you can buy, but you want to buy the black jacket that kind of has a story around it that makes you feel like the image that that company is, is projecting. You know, I mean, when you think about APC, their clothing is so basic, but you know when you wear that APC coat, you feel like you're Anna Karina and you're in a French New Wave movie and that's because that brand really tells this story and it's romantic and it's really well developed and so um, I think that when you have a company and when you're making clothes you knowing how to talk about kind of what your story is and what your little movie is that you've created is is really important otherwise they'll just see a black jacket I think it speaks again to being a brand. You know, you are the brand ambassador. You've got to embody that brand, and everything you do has got to be part of it. Otherwise, how is someone supposed to understand what you're trying to get across? Um, I was wondering what kind of investment backing you have, um, and like, who are the type of people that invest in your company, and does it make you nervous that you have to pay them back eventually? Um, we have no investors. We've never had investors. We started our company with um, a loan from my parents and a loan from Sophie's parents to make our first collection, um, which was, I think it was $3,000 each. Um, and that paid for all the samples that we made together and then our show. Um, and beyond that, it's just been, like I was talking about before, just time to really be creative and figure out ways to make money and make the clothes make money because after our first season, we had no store accounts, um, so we weren't like wholesaling anything. So we figured out this idea to, to do trunk shows and that really sustained our business for the first like two to three years um, until we really built like a steady roster of um, stores. But that was a huge part of being creative was just um, figuring out how to generate something from nothing. And then when you get big enough, you get what's called a factor, which I had no idea what, 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 what that was when I was in school. Um, but basically they lend you money against your invoices so you're able to pay all of your vendors. Um, and that's the kind of stuff we deal with every day that's not as creative as making clothes. <laughs> I think there's something beautiful in, in the way that the business has grown organically, though, and that's so important because uh, we mentioned sustainability earlier. Sustaining your own business, you know, the fact is that maybe on day one, if someone had said, I'll give you 100 grand if you want to show in the tents, that might not have been the best thing for you. You know, you might have been inundated with big orders, which you couldn't finance anyway, and even if you could and one of them cancelled, your business is over. But the fact that you grew it organically and you it forces you to be creative with the way you run your business and then to un, to learn as you go along so you know by the time you were ready to, to take on a factor you kind of knew what it was it wasn't like the guy walked in the, or the woman walked in on day one and you were perhaps coerced into a relationship that wasn't in your best interest definitely yeah, yeah i'm so thankful now looking back that we grew so slowly every season because if we 
had, for example, Barney's give us a huge order our first season, there's no way we would have known what, what to do with that. Um, and just so many different parts of our business, we, we just really failed, but we were so small that it like kind of didn't really matter. It was on such a small scale. Um, and it was really frustrating for us at the time. We just wanted to grow. We just wanted to get more store orders. But now that was the best possible thing that could have happened was that, that we didn't have any of that. And so much, so many of our really great creative ideas came out of the fact that we had no budget, that we would have to hand make all of our invites and come up with really creative ways to do things um, because we couldn't afford to spend a lot of money on making invitations. Um, and that just, you know, was in every aspect of the business down to the close was, okay, how do we make this really cool with no money? Um, and, you know, you see, we've seen so many of these young designers that, you know, have investment behind them or family money and they spend it all and so quickly and then they are unable to really learn about their business um, and it just is like flash in the pan. So I think, yeah, that's been like a really good thing for us. Sometimes the worst thing for a young designer is to have a lot of money and not know what to do with it. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, and I think that's that was so integral to the beginning of our company that it's almost become like part of our culture and it's kind of like fun for us now. I mean, the, the last show that we had, our budget for our set, I think was like 400, three or $400. So we were like, okay, what's, what's free or cheap? So inevitably our last two sets have been like made out of like rocks or dirt because it's free <laughs> and we can get it for free. <laughs> or something really cheap that looks cool, like ladders, our last, the show before this one was made from ladders that were just like spray painted. Um, and then they were gonna be covered in post-its, but it ended up looking totally weird, so we, we didn't do that. But it was just, it's still that kind of thinking. We still think like that, and it's kind of fun to be creative in that way. Very good, so, uh, oh, we've got some more questions. Here we go. There's also a movement now to produce locally. Do you guys still produce in the United States, um, or did you go overseas, and do you think it's important for customers to see locally made labels? That's a really uh, good question and very uh, interesting topic right now. And I think that a lot of designers, um, most people now are producing overseas and there's been, you know, a push to bring things back here. And for our main collection, most of it is produced in China. A bit of it is produced um, right around the corner. And for the t-shirt collection, it's all made in LA right now. Um, it's, it's difficult because what's happened is that, you know, even six years ago, there were so many more factories that we could use locally that the quality was good and the pricing was reasonable. And now it's gotten to a point where, you know, the garment district has really disintegrated. So what it remains is very expensive and the quality um, is really hard to find. So first we tried to produce in India, which was amazing because we loved going to India, we loved the culture, um, it was so inspiring to work there. Um, but we had problems with the factory we worked with. So then we found a factory in China, a um, few factories that, um, you know, got us the goods on time. We've never had a problem and so we've remained there. Um, we would love to produce in America if we could find a factory that we could make the same profit margins in order to stay in business, but it honestly is very hard and it's not something that I think we, we, it's a tricky situation. And that was part of why we wanted to bring the t-shirt line to have it all made in America to, to, to support the, the garment industry in LA and to have some of our business done here. In terms of collaboration, like with Via Spiga and Converse, were they things that were brought to you or that you sought out? And if they were in fact sought out, how did you go about that process with working with another company and bringing your ideas to them? Uh, both of those, both the, those two collaborations um, were people that approached us. Um, but we've definitely, just in our, in our spare time, we really love brainstorming about like new ideas and new projects that we could that we could do with larger companies that we feel like um, 
we could align ourselves with and it would make sense in terms of like the customer and the product. So we've definitely pitched ideas to people in terms of like making things a co-branded something with them. Um, but that wasn't the case with those two. Okay, well this is great. Now I've got one last question for you and it's pretty straightforward. Um, a lot of people here are uh, coming towards the end of their senior year or perhaps they're earlier on in their career and pretty much everyone I'm sure is about to embark upon some kind of career in fashion. What's the one little thing or big thing that you really want people to take away from this conversation? Because I've heard loads of great information and great tips, but I'm wondering if there's just this one thing that you think, keep this in mind, which puts you on the spot so I didn't you about this. I think really the most important thing, the thing that was amazing to me and is still amazing to me is that it's totally it's totally doable even if you have no money no contacts no resources if you're really smart and really creative you can figure out a way to make it happen if you really want it and you're willing to work really hard seven days a week for a while maybe for a really long time maybe for a short time if you get lucky um, it's completely possible yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, make a ton of stuff and figure out what it is that you make that is different from what other people are making. And then if you find that thing, really push it and explore it. And um, yeah, I mean, we never thought we would be doing this for six years, but we are. And I think that one thing that Parsons really teaches you is a very, very strong work ethic and discipline. And I think had we gone somewhere else, I don't know if we had been able, we would have been able to have done this for as long as we have. And I think that that's really one of the main reasons why we're partners too, is we both have the same work ethic. Um, so that's, that's something that Parsons gave us. And yeah, if you have that plus creativity, plus you know what it is that you want to do, go for it. You can do it. Fantastic. Well, thanks very much for coming Wait, in. Let's, we've got uh, one more question for you. One more. Okay. Question: um, How important do you think it is to have a business plan prior to starting your business? Well, we like still don't have a business plan, so <laughs> obviously, I don't know. I mean, it's it's great to know what kind of company you want and to model your company based on other companies that you respect and admire, and kind of follow um, their footsteps or steps they've taken, but. Um, in terms of a full-fledged business plan, um, I think it's good if you know how to do that and can do that, but even just a basic outline of the kind of company you want and the steps you're gonna take to get there and a less formal approach to it works just as well. Very good, well then let's, uh, let's say thank you very much to Lisa and Sophie.